Cats win it. Well, the good Cats win it 72-71 to tonight in Bramlage Coliseum as K-State gets their first ever win in the Big 12 Big East battle. The three prior games they had played, two losses here in Bramlage to Marquette in 2019 and 2021. And then last year, kind of the disaster against Butler after the Thanksgiving week tournament. Cats, they got tune-up games this week to get ready for Villanova. Both overtime games against Oral Roberts in North Alabama, and little did we know how perfectly those would prepare K-State for what they got tonight with Villanova, as for the third straight time, K-State goes to overtime. They win it for a third straight time. Jerome Tang now 9-0 in overtime games at K-State, and in addition to that, this is the first time since 1964 that K-State has played three consecutive overtime games. Tom Gilbert, the SID at K-State, let us know that they did win all three of those games as well. And that is also the last time K-State went to the Final Four. This team, long ways to go before Final Four talk starts happening, but it does feel like things are moving in the right direction. Welcome into K-State Online. I am Mason Voth, joined by Drew Galloway as we break down this wild, entertaining, exciting game between K-State and Villanova. I guess the, the number one place to start is with the play that took place just behind us in, in overtime. Tyler Perry with 3.9 seconds left, drills a step back three to put the Cats up by one and ultimately give them the win. Yeah, it's interesting to hear uh, after the game, Coach Tang and uh, Tyler Perry kind of walking us through the final play of how it was actually supposed to initially go to Cam Carter but the flare screen got taken away, and the flare screen turned to a ball screen, and then Tyler Perry just got the switch, and it was kind of like the old Kemba Walker step back a little bit, where he completely breaks the five for Villanova and steps back, and it's funny to hear Tyler Perry and Jerome Ting both say as soon as uh, Perry stepped back that they both knew that the shot was going in. Which is good for them because I did not. I just, I just, the way the game had played out, it was not a pretty one for Tyler Perry. He struggled in the game, and I mean, you go through and, and you look at how the night ends up working out for him. I mean, he does end up getting to 10 points in the game, but the shooting numbers weren't great. He was 2 of 10 from 3, 4 of 12 from the, the floor, and it, it felt like it was a struggle offensively when it came to shooting. Now, after the game, Jerome Tang was pretty pretty high on everything else that Tyler Perry did. He said he thought Tyler Perry had a great first half because of what he did defensively and how he was able to do things outside of shooting the basketball. And you agree with Coach Tang in that, or was that just more of a, hey, this guy made a big play for us, we still believe in him, I'm not going to dog him right here? Uh, I thought that Perry was playing pretty well in the first half. He was getting his teammates involved. What was interesting to see was Villanova had a bigger player on him, and they were kind of face guarding him a little bit when he was off the ball. It's just hard right now for K-State to get a lot of open looks offensively because there's still kind of a guard behind with Quez Glover uh, uh, injured and not playing and then still not having Naquan Tomlin. So the offense kind of goes through its ebbs and flows. But you, you can see when everybody's hitting shots, like it started to happen in the second half that Perry was starting to get free more and he just didn't knock him in until the until the final one that counted. And I mean, Coach Shanks said it best. He can go one of nine again, but if he hits the one to get two of ten with four seconds left to give him the win, you take that. Yeah, and I, I will give some benefit of doubt on this front. I mean, Villanova came out, it looked like the number one goal that they had was make sure that Tyler Perry does not get loose, get any open looks, because it was legit face guarding you follow this guy he was doubled most of the time once he did get the ball so it wasn't easy for him what that led to was a dynamic first half for Arthur Kaluma the Creighton transfer he busted out with 20 points in the first half uh, and then he ends up finishing the game with 26 one shy of his career high this is nothing new for Arthur Kaluma against Villanova last year he scored 18 and 19 in the two games that he played against the Wildcats when he was with Creighton so I'm sure Kyle Neptune is glad he will not have to ever see Arthur Kaluma face him again in all likelihood. What did you make of the game for Arthur Kaluma, and is this a jumping off point to where we can see a more aggressive Kaluma that takes charge as maybe the true number one of this team? It seems kind of that way where Arthur Kaluma is just a step away, and I've kind of said, I said this a few times during the game, where if he can knock down threes like he did tonight, he's going to be really hard to guard. He was 3 of 3 uh, from three-point range tonight. He was 10 of 12 from the field. It feels like everything's kind of been building up, and then this was kind of his final, like, hey, I'm here. This is what Jerome Tang expected me to be, and it was kind of talking me up to be. 
So it'll, it'll be fun to see where he goes throughout the season, and it starts again Saturday against LSU if he can take that next step and do it two games in a row. Yeah, we'll have to kind of monitor and see what it looks like the next time out for the Cats this weekend against LSU. So we've talked about the key players, obviously the biggest play of the game and everything. One thing to note, K-State led this game for a majority of it. Once they took the lead with just under eight minutes to play in the first half, they didn't let things get all that tight again until there was one point it got tied in the second half, and then obviously Villanova was able to, right at the end there, be able to be in a position to force OT, and then even had the lead. But K-State bounced back. They were down by as many as four in overtime. They handled it well. Uh, is there any concern that K-State wasn't able to hold a double-digit lead, or at least what was at arm's length most of the game, but let Villanova get back in it? I wouldn't say that I'm too terribly concerned about that. I mean, Vill Villanova's a good team. I know that their net ranking right now isn't very good. but well, I Real quick, I everybody can keep saying that. I don't think they're a terrible team. I will be the guy that I'm not trying to rain on the parade here. I do not believe Villanova to be that great of a team. I think think some of the wins they have, are, when we look back at the end of the year, we're going to be able to explain it. It's like, eh, okay, whatever, and obviously the losses have been bad. So uh, this is a good win. This is a step in the right direction for K-State, but I will at least be you know, the guy that holds the reins back. In comp it's a step up in competition. Yes. Yes. So it, it's – what I think is the most impressive thing about the win is that Eric Dixon three in overtime to put Villanova up by uh, to put Villanova up by four kind of felt like the dagger, yeah. and then K State has a really bad possession. The ball gets into the back court. They hustle. They get it, and David Gasson gets a little alley oop layup uh, to get K State back within two, and then the guts to get the stop again. So the, I mean, this team really showed some guts tonight. I think more than anything else. Yeah, and Jerome Tang gave a lot of credit afterwards. Also, the crowd showing up said, hey, I challenged him during the week. And he wanted to make it clear that, you know, it's not coming from a place of distaste towards the crowd. It's, you know, he, he then this is the way that he leads. I mean, it's very much honestly like a, a father-like approach where it's, I love this place and this crowd so much that I'm going to challenge you sometimes when you need to step up, and sometimes it's not going to come in the prettiest of ways. And he did that. He, he credited the crowd for responding. And, I mean, there were some moments here where outside of a KU game, this is probably close to the loudest. I've heard it at points. The crowd was strong. Sandstorm playing with 3.9 left after the shot from Tyler Perry was a great time. And – I, it, I think it, all of it disoriented Villanova because after the three is made, Kyle Neptune calls a timeout. There were a handful of Villanova players. I think they thought the game was over after the shot ended. That 15 seconds in the timeout, they're having to yell at two of their players from under the K-State basket to get down here, get in the huddle. And then they come out of the timeout, and Villanova doesn't even get the shot off. They're trying to drive it to the basket, not aware of the time situation. The horn goes, and uh, it was pandemonium in Bramlage. So what did you make of the crowd and the end-of-game situation that, I mean, truly the crowd, I think they rattled Villanova tonight. Yeah, the, the crowd was electric. I mean, you said that it, it was maybe a step below a KU game, but I, I thought it was pretty on par with, with a KU game. Uh, Sandstorm at the end was electric. And it was fun to hear everybody, and everybody stayed for the all of post game, which was really fun to see. And, and I think Villanova truly was rattled. I mean, it was also pretty loud at the end of the first half, and we had the discussion at the end of the first half that we didn't think that Villanova got the last shot off either. So to see the crowd really have an impact that way was kind of fun to see. And I mean that that time out with Sandstorm was one of the loudest Sandstorm moments that has happened at Bramlage in a long time, probably. I mean, KU last year was still pretty good, but that one was pretty on par with KU last year. Yep, it was a good time. Nice, nice step for the Wildcats to put themselves in a position moving forward now where you start to think the pieces are going to start to fit. You kind of get the bad taste out of your mouth out of the two games last week, and now really a good opportunity to try and prove yourself when you go on the road at LSU. LSU is not a great team by any means, but it's power conference competition on the road, can first you bounce? Game. First true road game. Can you bounce back after this big win and back it up? I'm big on the prove it games. When you win a big, significant game, you got to win the next one to make sure that this really counts and it matters. I think that K State can do it. I think this was a step in the right direction. We'll just have to see. The one thing that I think. Still, we, we saw the warts and the problems that's going to cause for K-State at times. There's not a true number one on the floor right now that late in the game can take control, clock's running down, I got to do something. A lot of what happens is predicated on either just you know a little bit of luck in getting open with Tyler Perry shots or 
working the ball and getting it to another guy. And when teams are so tight, it's been tough for K-State to get that. So I think they've got to establish that. Arthur Kaluma is close. I think you might have to defer to him a little bit more to create on his own. And then I would also throw out there, the rebounding at times is still pretty frustrating for K-State. Just a lot of tapping. Go up and grab it. And I think it's one of the reasons why Jarrell Colbert only played less than five minutes tonight. He got some chances in the first half, but he did not do a great job of rebounding. So he uh, only played, I think, four minutes and 44 seconds. So those are just the things that I think still need to be worked out. Step in the right direction. You're playing good competition over the next handful of games, not great competition. The Cats should absolutely win the next three against LSU, Nebraska, and Wichita State. As John Rothstein says, K-State is in a position to be in a position where this is a game where you can step up and then you to win the next three. And I think everybody's pretty happy with how non-conference play goes if you finish 10-2 and two with just the Chicago State game remaining uh, in non-conference. So, I mean, it, it, it's a step, and we'll see how it goes from here. Yep, I agree with that. Cats win it. The Purple Cats win the it. Good cats. The Good Cats, Purple Cats, any kind of cat you want to call that's a good one. 72-71 over Villanova, their first win in the Big 12 Big East battle. Second win against the Big East opponent this year. Big 12 on their way to winning this edition of the Big 12 Big East battle. And now K-State sits at 7-2 as they hit the road for Baton Rouge on Saturday at LSU. Derek Young will be down there. He'll have great coverage from that over on K-State Online. And we'll have plenty of coverage for football and basketball going on at K-State stayed online over at on three and also on the YouTube throughout the rest of the week. It has gotten a lot more interesting as uh, it has been reported that Colin Klein has been offered the Texas A&M offensive coordinator job. So uh, we might melt down with you. We might talk you off the ledge. We might do a lot of things depending on what goes down there because this is the second straight year that a high profile job has been offered to Colin Klein. Turned it down last year when Notre Dame came calling. Will he do it again this year when it comes to the Aggies and the mighty SEC? So for Drew Galloway, I'm Mason Voth. Thank you for watching K-State Online.